is sync. Can't sync is anything you wish to add, alter, or split. Page one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Anything from anyone? If not, thanks very much. So we go and into the action log. Nothing on the action log. We we'll go into our individual individualized care presentation. Thank you so much. Do you want me to turn the slides now? That one. Okay. Actually, introduce. Yes. Uh, so I'm um, we're joined today by Alison Blakey, who is our director of clinical pathways and assessment um, and Mike who is our uh, senior operational compliance for um, EMC and the clinical club. Um, I'm going to hand over to them to talk about all of the work that we have been talking about around the making sure patients get the right in the work. Thank you so much, Penella. Uh, lovely to be here, lovely to see you all. Uh, so, as Penella said, I'm Director of the Clinical Assessment and Pathways. Uh, my whole portfolio is around uh, identifying the right patients that we can do something different with other than taking a patient to an emergency department. So, as early as possible in their journey with us, so at the point of call or at each step in their journey, uh, thinking about what can we do differently and how can we better impact A on their journey and B on the wider NHS. So all of my teams uh, focus on that and that's our mission. Um, we are here today to talk about a patient's story um, and we will be thinking through what this story says about the different way that we are now operating within our clinical club, uh, which is a group of clinicians in our control room. Uh, they have a variety of functions that they undertake. One is about safety and safety oversight. And the second is about, again, identifying those patients who probably don't need to go to an emergency department, but actually what is the best route for them. Uh, so this patient, um, and we'll go into the slides in a moment, uh, we absolutely would have sent a double crude ambulance, and this patient absolutely would have ended up in an emergency department had we sent a double crude ambulance. Um, and so through working differently, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment, we've actually impacted positively both on the patient, their outcome, and the wider NHS. What? Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So, uh, yes, as Nelly introduced, I look after EOC Clinical Safety and the Clinical Pub currently. Uh, and we'd like to share the story with this patient, um, thank you, uh, who recently accessed our service initially by the uh, NHS 111 route. Uh, and what we'd like to do really is follow their journey through. So this call for a patient, uh, she was 70 years of age, I felt generally unwell and was struggling to control her blood glucose and so we contacted NHS 111. The assessment undertaken by a non clinical health advisor identified that the call should be transferred to the 999 service for the patient to as a category two. The call was received as low blood sugars uh, and added to our CAT2 segmentation team. So in the London Ambulance, we're one of two early adopter sites for category two segmentation, which has now been rolled out across England, and we are supporting nationally for other trusts to roll their models out and to optimise them. For this patient, she did meet criteria to be clinically navigated as a category two patient. So a call that has been previously identified by our, uh, analysis of many thousands of calls for patients who may benefit from a clinical telephone assessment prior to the dispatch of an ambulance. The clinical navigator is a senior clinician within our control room, but part of our new model is now co-located with our dispatchers to provide face-to-face -face support and advice to dispatchers 
on how and when to dispatch uh, ambulances in order priority to oversee clinical safety. There are three options a clinical navigation, which is a rapid review of the information transmitted to us in this case by NHS 111 or obtained by the call, is to either upgrade the call because they're clinically concerned about the patient, to leave the call for the face to face response as the original priority, or to allocate a clinician to undertake a telephone assessment. But this case specifically, the clinician identified that the patient would benefit from a clinical telephone assessment before dispatch, and we reviewed the call two minutes after the call was received into the 999 Emergency Operation Centre. Just, just that. So, how did that go? <clears throat> so, it comes to us by the ITK and the call schematic populates on the geographic dispatch stack of the, where, the call, where the patient is located. And the clinician will open the call and review the information on there. So, the assessment by the health advisor, this patient alert, what's their medical history. Do we have uh, evidence we've been to the patient previously and they have quite a complex medical history? Is the response priority appropriate for what the patient is presenting with? And then make a, a, an educated clinical decision or not. Gee, I don't think a telephone assessment can bring anything to the part if the patient needs a face to face assessment because of observations. Or actually, let's have a chat with the patient first because it might be a pathway that we can refer the patient to before dispatching an ambulance. Perfect. Thank you for now. Uh, and so part of the clinical assessment are clinicians within the control room. We have implemented what we've revo called the revised dispatch model. Um, I'm trying not to use its previous term. Uh, and we've taken, we've increased the number of clinicians within our control room. So our clinical team navigators are about seven clinicians. We have doubled our capacity in clinical team navigators since August of last year. And we're on our way to recruit our full establishment of clinical advisors. What that's enabled us to do is to take a Pan London view where our clinicians are working from all of the calls and give them a smaller area of London, so an ICS focus. And this increases their bandwidth to oversee safety and ensure the appropriate response for patients. It also means that we can assign clinicians to the area they are used to working in. So they are familiar with the pathways, some of the challenges, the hospitals and the demographics in that area. For this patient, the clinical advisor was a paramedic, band six, who uh, undertook the clinical telephone assessment, and that's supported by the Manchester triage system, which is clinical decision support tool. It's a reductive process to ensure that the assessment is safe and to elicit any time critical features that would require an immediate dispatch for the patient. This patient in particular uh, felt generally unwell, but was unable to give any specifics, but there were no time critical red flags that we needed to consider at that time of the assessment, but they were struggling to regulate their blood glucose. They asked for advice on how to manage their insulin, which as uh, paramedics, that is not something we're normally trained to do. Uh, and so we have some senior support within the control room within our clinical hub that can provide face to face clinical leadership for our paramedics to ensure that we have optimised referrals to alternative care pathways as opposed to ED by default because we can't answer a question. Thank you. Within our control room, we have our senior clinical decision makers. These were introduced uh, following a period of industrial action last year where we had some ED doctors and consultants in the control room. Uh, we've continued with that model and it's evolved as uh, sits where the senior decision makers are providing that face to face clinical leadership for the paramedics. So there are often cases that were presented within 999 that is just outside of the curriculum for a paramedic. Uh, they also help us to gather data to have uh, how to optimise our referrals to alternative care pathways. The paramedic on this occasion consulted with the senior decision makers specifically around the request for guidance on how to manage the patient's insulin. The senior decision maker was a GP who is uh, well versed in advising patients on how to manage their condition. Uh, and that having reviewed the patient's records, including their summary care record and information held by the GP, 
was comfortable that that patient was suitable for a alternative referral that didn't require emergency ambulance response. So instead of sending a double pre ambulance, which we absolutely would previously have sent to this quite complex patient, actually we uh, were able to refer this patient into one of our UCR cars. Uh, I've previously spoken at board about uh, the development of UCR cars within the London Ambulance Service. And those cars are staffed by a paramedic and a community clinician, uh, in this instance, a community nurse who also uh, luckily uh, had a specialism in diabetes. Um, and so this patient was referred successfully into uh, one of our resources and uh, they were able to attend within that two hour time frame that the UCR teams uh, adhere to and uh, were able to undertake blood analysis and a follow up appointment for that patient. Um, and as I said at the start, uh, this patient absolutely would have ended up in an emergency department had we not done this assessment earlier on in their journey and had the availability of other types of resources, uh, such as the UCR card, which we've just described. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, well done. Well done. Thanks very much indeed. Questions and comments? Any other observations? Yeah, it's a really good question. We have internally uh, follow up processes for lots of our patients anyway, and this falls within that. Uh, so we have a recontact audit for patients who deteriorate within 24 hours of contact with us as an organisation and all of those cases get reviewed by a senior clinician and so it would be picked up through that and it was not. Um, we're also able to follow through uh, the community referrals for each of the patients that are uh, utilising the community response cards. Um, so the patient didn't go to hospital? Did not go to hospital. Uh, so followed up in the community the next day, uh, bloods were fine, there was a follow-up plan, uh, safety netting with the patient's daughter and some education as well about different ways to manage diabetes when you're unwell with something else. That's a very positive um, case, thank you. So from the <clears throat> system view, and you may not know this, have the patient tried to contact the diabetic team or the GP practice before calling? Uh, good question and probably we don't know the yeah. answer. Okay. What I can say is that we very, very frequently see uh, patients who access 111 because it's been quite difficult to get hold of their core teams mm -hmm. uh, and quite a lot of those patients end up coming into the 999 staff because they're yeah. Because I'm just looking at the timing, so I think this happened in the late afternoon about yeah. 5 o'clock, so <laughs> my question is, like, what was happening between 8.30 a.m. and 5 p.m.? Yeah. I suppose the second question is, um, what um, communication goes back to the patients to practice so that they can follow up? Yeah, um, so we're able to uh, add notes into the patient's summary care record as an attendance. And we've also got, um, not for this patient specifically, uh, but we've set up a process of sharing incidental findings and information with the registered GP. Um, so that's something that we're also developing. For this patient specifically, uh, the GP would have been uh, informed of our contact with the patient, uh, our findings with the patient, both over the phone assessment and the face-to-face -face assessment. And then they would also be uh, aware of the follow-up. So mm -hmm. the community team following up in their coming days. Yeah, electronically. Yeah. Okay. Not a letter. Not a letter. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Not a letter. <laughs> yeah. On the um, the response, or globally, what percentage of patients that we hear from that are amenable to this um, UCR response get what? 
Sorry, can you ask the question well, again just while I process it? Yeah, so what the numbers of people that are call us, mm -hmm. there'll be a certain portion that would benefit from this type of response. Yeah. The urgent uh, community response. Do, does everybody who would benefit from that get it? No, or is it? It's good. It's, 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 right, it's constrained. So yeah. of the amount of, of course that would benefit from yeah. that, you're, just roughly, and say you know precisely what proportion of, of people who could be dealt with in this way are actually dealt with. Yeah. So we think it's important. Yeah, also, Lovely, from elephant support. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you may be before, but I think. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think that's wrong. Um, currently, we have uh, two cars in most ICD areas. We've got one in uh, North West London and about to be one in South East London. Um, what's helpful is that there are also community teams uh, based uh, purely in the community so we can also refer into those teams this patient was too complex for that to be able to assess this patient over the phone and get all of the right level of information given their presentation and then make a referral over the phone having not actually seen the patient would be much too complex which is where the cars come in perfectly um, but in terms of opportunity there's huge opportunity because we think about the volume of all these patients that we see, catheter problems, uh, complex medical problems like like this. Opportunity is massive. And you know very well, this is a failed patient care plan. And the patients sort of contacted the practice team that looked after them earlier in the daytime and nowhere near one with one. And you manage completely appropriately. Yeah. Maybe the same card sent out by the practice that needed face to face assessment, urgently, probably not. And so it really does speak about how we begin to address care planning more widely in the system. Because clearly we see the failed care plans. Uh, and then we have to put something in that's very good, but most of you have got it right earlier. Yeah. I think that's really good. Yeah. Also, make a point about the. Oh, no, I'm not. Because I'm. So this response that LAS has produced is a very good response to the patients in the here and now. It's much more expensive than sending a double crew ambulance to convey them to hospital. And you think of the resource we have, the seniority of the conditions we have used to the um, which I think we need to go back to the conditioners with to say, here and treat does not actually say that in fact in quite all cases if the direct costs are higher. The same thing to the system, however, it is much higher because you just avoided an A and E attendance and possibly a national admission. But Mark's point is the real one, is also the real one, which is if primary care has had the capacity to see this patient earlier in the day and the patient specifically either did, didn't contact them because they didn't think they get a GP appointment or did contact them and didn't get through, the right answer is this is a primary care piece of bread and butter work which would have been the best patient experience and the most cost effective to the NHS. Um, we did the next best patient's experience and better cost effective to the NHS than the default would have been. Yes. And I was just going to ask how we, how we record this. So it started out as a hear and treat and ended up being a see and treat, right? Yeah. It started out as a one 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 call. Sorry, it was a one 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 call that went to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do we end up with multiple recordings of the same treatments? So it will be a see and treat okay. case um, because we've sent a resource. If we've been able to refer the patient to the community <coughs> team, uh, that would have been a hear and treat. So we only count each patient once wherever they end their journey. So, so I think just sort of going right back and yeah, this was a patient where the triage through whatever system we've used was not incorrect because you've got a diabetic patient who required some form of intervention to stop them becoming sicker. But the category two segmentation has permitted us to be able to identify those patients where we can do something different to send an emergency ambulance and do the right thing for the patient. And what that then means is that there's an ambulance available to go to a patient who 
they have been identified as having cardiac chest pain or stroke. So both patients are benefiting from that from that uh, opportunity that we've been affording through CAT2 segmentation. Good. Oh, no, it's really good. Thank you so much. Oh, that was really good. And, um, yeah, there's clearly a lot more to be done on this front, isn't there? Well, we could start with you, so to give people that right like, care. Be interested to know, Alison, when you get a moment, just the situation in the southeast, maybe outside of the meetings. So, no, I've got them too. I'd like to do that. So, Mike and Alison, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so um, my report, very brief report for me, it's a really important thing that's coming up on, but um, I think I think what we're seeing overall is that we'll hear about this as we go through the, the papers, but it's a good steady improvement in performance, um, whilst at the same time, thank you, um, we're in really challenging financial times, in time. we know that from our discussion around future finances, um, now those, those plans are yet to be finalised, um, we are obviously keen to improve our performance, keen to improve our quality, whilst at the same time recognising that we've got some really tight times ahead in common with the rest of the NHS. I think really positive around improvement. I think you know, we've seen some real issues, particularly I've noticed it my visits to EOC in particular. It's, you know, it's really good to hear people being upbeat around that. Um, and we're obviously recruiting well on the upside as well, aren't we? It's just want to make sure we match the other improvement of the uh, they make making sure the solution there was for them. I think the team's working, the tethering has been a success so far. They're really well done to the team. But they, I think this is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, and there's much more to do as we look to um, evolve out to those in the areas who are taking responsibility for performance. But they they will also obviously need to have the wherewithal to drive that performance by being given the uh, the means of controlling what they've got under their very feet. So we're looking for more mm -hmm. to come from that side. So I think the staff survey results, and we hear about those, are very promising, but they also kind of reveal some good stuff that we feel what else we want to do. Yeah, and there's a, a huge amount for us to do. And we should be very cognizant of those challenges ahead. And I think that will major part of what we do as a board is a good oversight of cultural change and all of those issues that we've got to be cognizant of as we go ahead. Um, I've been out and out doing visits as usual. Um, the interesting ones, national chairs and London chairs, pretty tough messages coming down from the centre. I know I've had private meetings with the Neds, so I repeat all of that, but very much the message around the pressure coming in from the top around traditional resources that have gone to the NHS and that desire to see the return on those investments. Um, I've been out and visited Barking and Ilford. I mean, it's always very fun going out about visiting the teams. And as I said during the private session, visiting Queen's Bromford as well. And I was impressed, despite all the challenges they've got, I was impressed by our relationships with Tim. That you could tell that everybody knew each other. It was a good, good positive relationship. And I think well done for those who were working on those relationships. Because we know that we've got some real challenges with handover times with other hospitals uh, across London. Um, had a good discussion with David Astley, the outgoing chair of. Um, CCAM is really good to talk to him about the issues. So to be practical about how he how he's doing his job, picking his brains about things that he's he's been doing. Um, and the that, that's an organization that's had some challenges, but they're really making real good progress. And I enjoyed having spending some time with him talking through what, what they are doing. Um, and we're planning to do a visit down to visit their um, uh, their new control room, which is a combined EOC. 111 and make ready centre down the journey. So I hope you go and see that, which is all part, I think, of our approach to collaboration, which we've heard about on collaboration plans for southern ambulances. But I think being, and I certainly intend to do that during the next year, getting out and meeting more people, seeing what they're up to as well. And on that um, score, I visited Mason and Tubridge as well. I was wanted to see particularly what's happening on their handovers in ED. And I know it's a different part of the world, but there were no delays at all. Yeah, and it's really interesting to see how they've worked that through. And echoing some of the things we talked about earlier, a lot of this was not just about CCAM, this was around the internal processes with NED, what they were doing to reduce uh, demand. The presence of GPs is really interesting. Um, it was really interesting to see all the things they put together to take out delays right the way through the system. So, and I, I appreciate Tom as well as it's not um, London, 
but nevertheless, you know, they um, they have fewer GPs per head of population. Yeah. yeah. Do they? Yeah. But it was really interesting because the GPs not only serviced patients, but you could get if you if you could get an appointment within ED to come back in an hour. And also they were dealing with staff who needed to go and see a GP. There were some real classes in I was really impressed. Their triage was very robust as well about people being directed by the seniority of the people who were at the beginning of that process, who were directing them to, to the different phases. It was a very, very impressive. And then use of data is sort of nationally regarded and all that. So we're on the whole lot, but not just one, just one thing. So anyway, so any questions for me? Thanks very much. Uh, so nearly everything in my report is actually in someone else's. So I'm going to keep this very brief. The staff survey results, we are the most improved ambulance trust in the country. That book confirmed last week in fact. So that is really good. And I'll leave the rest to Damien and Anne. Uh, on demand and performance updates, uh, you're going to get all of this from Fenella and Pauline. But the highlights I'd like to share with you are in call answering, in the last three weeks, we've had we've been in the top three for answering the failure of the country. That is a massive improvement than we are before. Uh, on heart attack survival rates, we did our best January ever at 13% of patients who had a heart attack having a return to spontaneous circulation. So I'm sure Fanny will talk about that. Um, we've got some new telephone tech, which means we can now warm transfer a patient who's phone 999 to 111 rather than asking them to phone back. One more month, we can do it uh, ourselves. And you've already heard a story about uh, all the investments of people going on in here and treat, and we've achieved some of our highest here and treat rates ever uh, outside the strike time. Uh, we've been very busy with visits. Uh, we had Ed Daly came to New Malden, and he so, he's so liked it, he's coming for a ride out tomorrow. Uh, Emily Thornbury's done a ride out out on. Islington and Steve Tuckwell, the new MP for Hillingdon, P2 Hillingdon. Uh, we've also been at OSCs talking about our performance too. Uh, there's a lovely picture of our former chief paramedic, uh, John Martin, getting his King's Ambulance Medal. Uh, but we'd better put that in because he got it for being in London, no, not because he went to Southwest Ambulance Trust. Uh, the, um, Rosamund Pike came to uh, learn about how to be a paramedic. She's starring in the film where she has to be a paramedic. Uh, so she came learning. Uh, and our charity is um, going from strength to strength. And quite a lot of us, almost 70 of us, walked up the O2. Uh, uh, it was, the weather wasn't great. Uh, the other week, and we raised 20 grand. So our charity got very good. Thank you, Peggy. I don't know that was a bit of a challenge, wasn't it? Walking up there. Well, I didn't like this natural. I thought the number was all right. The going down did not like that. Well done. But I think that's well done. I just thought that. Oh, well, yeah. you were there and the money was right. So you were at the front as well. Any questions? If not, thanks very much indeed. And I would you for me, please. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk through the performance. Uh, oh, so, 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 oh, sorry, Karen. <laughs> Uh, I, I thought it was worth just highlighting the staff survey in the chief exec report because it it's quite a remarkable improvement not I think for any trust in the current climate not just for ambulance trusts and things and it's um you know to shift the dial on culture um like that is I think quite a big deal um and it's testament to everyone so I, I thought it was probably worth just highlighting it a bit more I and obviously I think culture is not fixed yet though so that's something that needs um you know continued focus and we'll pick up on that just a quick i think minor point the table on page 35 the numbers don't add up on on the um number of thank yous received either that or i don't understand the table but it's nothing to spend time on now it's just for correction later well, thanks very much Right. Thank you. Uh, so the performance reports in the pack uh, refers back to the January and February 2024 period. So if I start with our control room, our 999 control room, so uh, in terms of contacts into the control room, uh, we've seen a decrease across January and February uh, after December, not unsurprising as we start to come out of the, the winter period. 
uh, pleasingly, our call answering mean uh, has been uh, considerably improved at five seconds and two seconds, respectively, for January uh, and February. And it's shown quite a consistent improvement, as Dan was just alluded to, uh, over the last uh, few weeks, where we're now seeing uh, consistently below the 10 second national uh, expectation. Now, I think there are a number of factors that link towards that. Um, there's been a lot of work undertaken within the EOC around increasing the call handling resource that we have in place to match the demand uh, that we have. Um, and that in itself has increased some of the culture within the control room um, and some of the pressures. Uh, we're seeing a, a reduction of the bar, a reduction in sickness. Uh, with uh, those that are in post, uh, along with the the wider transformation plans that we have within the control room. That will continue into next year with our recruitment plans. If I move on to uh, ambulance services, uh, in terms of our Category 1 performance, uh, we have seen an improvement since December in January and February with uh, 7 minutes 24 and 7 minutes 20 seconds for February. Uh, and it should be noted that that's below the national average. So that means we're getting to those critical patients uh, really, really uh, quickly. If I move on to our Category 2 performance, uh, we've shown again some improvement uh, against uh, December, November and December. Uh, in January, uh, reporting 36 minute Category 2 uh, and February 37 minute Category 2. Again, when we benchmark ourselves against the national position, uh, we see that we are um, seeing significant improvements month on month. Uh, if I move on to our category three performance, um, we have seen some challenges with those uh, that, that cohort of patients. Uh, in January, we achieved a one hour, 14 minute uh, for our category three of February of one hour, uh, 11 minutes. Um, however, this was significantly better than the national average uh, for both of those months. If I move on to our hours lost uh, at handover, uh, again, it's a positive picture. So we are seeing a reduction in the overall hours uh, that have uh, been lost uh, with crews awaiting their handover. You can see throughout uh, January it was 10,000 hours and in February it was 9,000 hours. So whilst it's a considerable number of hours, it is an improvement on the position we found ourselves in last year. Um, and that can be largely attributed to the introduction of the 45 minute handover process, uh, stronger relationships with the hospitals um, and the cohorting of patients really being taken care of by the hospital staff rather than using our ambulance staff to do that. Um, we do have a couple of hospitals that are really still the outliers in terms of uh, handovers, uh, those being North Middlesex Hospital uh, and Queen's Romford, although with the latter, Queen's Romford, we should note that there's been considerable improvement over the last year uh, of where we found ourselves. And um, in terms of North Middlesex Hospital, uh, it's subject to uh, quite an intensive support from both ambulance operations and the hospital to really try and manage down some of those delays that we're seeing uh, and the avoidable harm of patients waiting for a handover. Uh, if I move on to our see and treat, so uh, our see and treat, so this is where uh, we are seeing patients uh, on scene, uh, we're treating them successfully and not requiring to take them to hospital. Uh, we have seen uh, across January and February, 30% so uh, of those patients not uh, needing to be transferred to hospital. I think we need to link that together with some of the work that we've been undertaking, um, as we've just heard through uh, through Alison and Mike, uh, within the control room around him and treat. So we are actually sending ambulances out to progressively more sicker patients because we're managing the, the patients that are of a lower acuity uh, safely within the, the control room. So we would expect to see that number start to rise as we get to the right patients. Um, and similarly, that links to the patients that have been conveyed to the emergency department um, with uh, being 52% and 50% uh, in February 2024. Um, you will also see in the performance pack uh, how we compare to the national metrics across category one, two, here and treat, see and treat, and see and convey, um, and largely we, can, we compare quite favourably. Moving on to the clinical hub, uh, Philella, would you like to 
pick up talking about them. Yeah, so Clinical Hub um, staffing has increased significantly since the autumn in order to be able to maximise our beer and treat and also deliver on Category 2 segmentation, which is the pro national process of being able to provide an additional clinical assessment to a co cohort of patients that are initially categorised to Category 2 to see if there is a better alternative for the patient without delaying the dispatch of an ambulance if they need it. Uh, we have seen that in February, 15,000 clinical assessments were taken compared to 9,000 in August of last year. Um, we are on track to continue to increase the clinical advisors and to make this an opportunity for more and more of our clinicians uh, to gain that experience as they uh, move up through their career within the ambulance service. We've also broadened out the skill mix, so we've got mental health nurses and experienced um, primary care ED nurses who are doing shifts with us as well to bring that knowledge into, uh, into the operation. The, um, the other change which has happened since we last reported the board is the embedding of the new dispatch model, which sees the navigators, so the clinicians sitting next to our very experienced dispatchers, to be able to help to identify those patients where an alternative pathway using pharmacy first being able to refer back into their own GP would um, benefit them and to be able to make sure that happens in a timely way. It's good. So in terms of the uh, integrated culture of care, yeah, okay. thanks for me. So um, before I go into saying the detail for this, as it's been through the uh, previous session of the performance report, we've embarked on a fairly comprehensive uh, change and transformation program with the IPC, started about six weeks ago. Um, and the program looks at all the elements of how we deliver the service. So, from the front end of um, key management work and the use of process managing. All the way back to how the PAS operates, how we operations that, how we manage the queue, how we place resources, the demand, what information we use, and how we engage with both our resilience partners and our staff. So, that is a significant piece of work and something that is so we have an involvement in the service. Um, and I'm hopefully, then it's a five month program, and hopefully, at the end of that, we'll invest in new processes that. Are um, where we can um, space better for patients and better efficiency and better for staff as well. But the performance end that we have before us, as fully said, relates to January and February. Uh, activity, the first graph in the section, which is probably the same as it has been in the previous months. Um, uh, and however, the abandoned rate, uh, so the cause of it, uh, but the abandonment rate has uh, increased previous in uh, January and the reasons for the best part of this program, including the previous uh, pathway processes. Uh, speaking to answer, again, we're not where we want to be. It is like it is impacted on the phasing of the demand and when demand comes in on which and the facilities in the same month, in the same periods, um, we're looking at that. And so the graph shows that the latter part of the group um, went down to 94 seconds from the average, where we have some very small progress in medical, whether or not that's sustained or not. Is a, is a um, and then the other area of focus is clinical ring banks, all time. So we need to be, um, and you're not meeting with a big device for that. So there's a lot of focus on this within this piece of work around uh recurring effects. Uh we can do that so we're we'll still going to go back to the Oh sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, in terms of our resilience and emergency response, we've had uh, two declared significant incidents since our last reporting period. Uh, both of them were fires uh, in residential properties, uh, one uh, towards the end of December and one at the beginning of March. And they were both well managed within our plans. 
uh, and uh, sadly one patient died, a number of patients were conveyed to uh, hospital. They're working through the learning from those incidents and incorporating that into uh, future training to be able to support our commanders and our responding, uh, responding staff. Uh, we've had a small number of business continuity incidents relating to some of the ageing technology and infrastructure, um, a lot of which sits largely outside of the trust and is national infrastructure related to uh, Airwave. Um, and again, the learning from each of those incidents is being taken uh, into developing uh, our plans to make sure we're as resilient as, uh, as we can be. Um, we'll also see there have been a number of exercises that the Trust has participated in uh, with partners, uh, both inside London and outside of London, in a number of different scenarios to uh, ensure that we remain ready to respond uh, should London require us to. Uh, and the emergency planning team are busy working towards the summer season uh, of events. Uh, if I finally turn to advanced practice, so uh, we've recently recruited, uh, been out to recruit for critical care uh, paramedics. Um, we saw a phenomenal response, 118 applications for quite a relatively small uh, requirement of posts. So all internal? Uh, they were a combination of internal and external, um, so uh, they were a lot of interest in that post. Mm -hmm. We're taking 25 through to assessment centre later in June, and we're quite confident we will fill the vacancies that we have from the critical care uh, perspective. Uh, if I move on to the urgent care, uh, um, uh, urgent care paramedics, we've recently appointed a consultant paramedic in urgent care um, and a small number of clinical supervisors to support the ongoing development uh, of those uh, urgent care paramedics. And again, you will see that of the last of the 12 that we recruited last year, they're well on their way to uh, being qualified and being able to practice completely autonomously uh, in their role, um, which will then see them be able to support the wider organisation in terms of education, uh, learning, clinical audit and, and the other four pillars of their role. And I should pause at that point and perhaps take any questions. Thanks, Pauline. Any questions from Pauline? I just ask a question about the clinical leave bags. Do we know about when there's this level of delay about what patients do? So when we when we do ring back, are they gone and done something else? You were okay. Um so so during the time that they're waiting for a ring back, it's the sort of advisor will keep in touch with them and identify if there's any change in that condition. They'll be able to reprioritize them. A small number will have made their way to uh, definitive care, either to an emergency department directed onto a UTC or through to their GP, with um, supporting pharmacy first as well. And um, others, and this is one of the big areas for us to be working on, where uh, they perhaps haven't had the opportunity to look at alternatives, they have waited. And for us to bring back, and so making sure that we are closing that time that they're waiting and in touch with them is really important. But to, to be clear, some of the patients here in Asia should have had a ring yeah. back and pursued that. And we have caused harm by not doing it within the right time scale, uh, which is why getting this right is really important. And we're convinced that actually getting much, much closer very quickly to the performance targets that we should be meeting. Just just to check for now, so we do um, segment those patients, right? So you've got your priority ones, priority twos, yeah. priority ones within 20 minutes, right? Because I know we did that review in the data group. Yeah. But then priority two, how, how many priorities are there? Are there different six. Well, six. in some, uh, North East London was six and South East London was eight. Is but a lot of the uh, patients who are in the five to eight are. Um, Primary care ring back within 24 hours. So those are the ones that with the commissioners have been very focused on actually guiding those patients back to, to primary care or back to pharmacy first and self-care advice mm -hmm. to free up the capacity to be able to focus on the priority one to priority three, which forms an objective for our business plan. Yeah. Do we report on those? Do we report on whether we meet the target for priority ones within 20 minutes, priority yeah. two as well? Yes. Yeah. But, but it's in true one on one commissioning actually. Yeah. With five separate one on one contracts, yeah. with five separate KPIs yeah. and yeah. targets. Yeah. So it's unclear. Yeah. Uh, 
um, what exactly the right thing to do is. Which is just where the transformation needs to yeah. influence. Okay, yes. Well, then thanks for mentioning me. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk around um, some of the areas of quality. Uh, I will take my report as read and just bring it out a few of the highlights. And then as we take questions, um, take the possible either myself because these fall across both of our um, directorates. So um, under SAFE, um, again, 999 incident reporting and 111 IDC incident reporting remains very good which is indicative of having a good and supportive reporting culture. The top incidents for 999 are medical equipment, medicines management and security violence and aggression, uh, which we're monitoring very carefully through all of the governance groups that report into the quality and our quality, quality assurance group. When we identify a problem with medical equipment, then action to mitigate that problem is immediately undertaken. And you'll see one example there of um, an action that was taken and a risk alerted to the company. The Fixing the Basics programme, uh, which is uh, rolling out, has successfully rolled out the tethered fleet. So that's fleet being allocated to each individual uh, group station. And that also means that the ambulance has the right equipment on it. So it's a tethered equipment as well, which is significantly going to improve the availability. Uh, one 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 incidents are around communication, uh, care and consent, and uh, clinical concern from someone referring a patient in or asking them to get hold of a patient. All of that is fed back in real time to learn from it and make sure that we can improve those relationships. Overdue incidents continue to be addressed and are a challenge in the 999 system. There's uh, 840. Uh, but that's across the whole of 999 and in one one a similar number and through the focus review group uh, meetings that we do we monitor that. Uh, safeguarding continues to be very busy um, with a large number of referrals particularly during the winter for uh, falls and diabetes referrals which leads back to the case that we've just heard about um, so a 23 percent increase but our compliance with training is good and where it's a dip down, which is in EOC, there was an action plan which is being monitored on a weekly basis to bring it back in line. You'll see there on the health and safety team, the number of riddle incidents that have been reported. So that's where something has happened, which uh, requires somebody to be off work for a period of time. The majority of um, those are slips and trips, but of concern, um, and these are not all riddle reportable, but for health and safety, 686 physical assaults on staff, of which 57% are physical assaults, which due to the clinical condition of the patient. So actually working with our clinicians to understand that and how to de-escalate is a piece of work that the education team have been leading on. Thinking about our effectiveness, um, the clinical performance indicators have continued to be undertaken. So this is uh, audit of the, the notes that are written about the patient. Um, and I think we would all congratulate 13 group stations who have achieved 100% completion of their auditing, which is uh, during the winter, incredibly challenging at times. Um, Daniel had talked around our cardiac arrest outcome for January, where we saw that 30 percent of the patients that we attended got their heart started again, which for January, what we know, demand is high and uh, more patients are very seriously unwell. That was very good. And really importantly, the time for our uh, colleagues in the EOC on the telephone to be able to give the advice to start chest compressions reduced by 30 seconds. Uh, and that is going to help. The other key thing that is going to increase the number of people who survive a cardiac arrest should they suffer one is getting a defibrillator, so the shock pads, onto that patient as quickly as possible. You will see that through the work that um, Roger and the team have been doing, that we've now got over 12,000 lifesavers trained and 9,000, 9,500 public access defibrillators. So um, 
we need to be activating them more than seven times, particularly when we see that blind though the patients got their heart restarted. It speaks for itself, and I think we all need to be pushing that uh, wherever we are talking to people about getting people confident they are not going to do harm, they're going to potentially save a life. Uh, clinical supervision is something which I'm sure Pauline will talk about in a, a minute because it's very much our focus for making sure that our clinicians feel uh, well supported in the decisions they're making and also feeding into that is our clinical audit and I have just uh, shown you the outcome of our most recent clinical audit which is fed back to the QR code but posters as well so that our clinicians know uh, what they um, how the, the care that they're providing is meeting with the standards that we uh, have written. Uh, health inequalities we talked about last time as just uh, beginning, but it's very much now um, evolving into three work streams. And uh, the most recent uh, engagement that we had was Saturday just gone, where we met with the Sickle Cell Society um, or Sickle Cell Representative Group in Croydon to learn about their experience of um, of the care that we can provide, but also gave an opportunity to uh, for us to gather more information about how we can improve the care, but also learn more about their, their conditions. Um, I will stop there. Um, Pauline, on clinical supervision, is there anything more that you wanted to say? Um, I, I just had a couple of questions, but I'm, I'm happy to read. Oh. So, so um, just on the London Lifesaver, um, have we been able to infiltrate companies so that we run we run events in companies and we can actually tackle a, a massive organization and sort of one go and have them then continue to campaign on our behalf? That's one question. Maybe you can answer. Yeah, so um, we uh, we have done some stuff on um, systematic focus on range of schools. Mm. And that has affected <laughs> Work very hard to get up to the, going to two schools a week, which is really tricky. Because with the, the history of this type of initiative, you can announce it and do it, and you don't actually do what you say you're going to do. So we have managed to hit two schools a week, but that has been very stretching on the teams. Uh, in relation to companies, we're doing more kind of public events, things like public events, train stations, stuff like that, during the school holidays. And our next focus, those school holidays, we are thinking about and possibly connecting that to donations around particular relators. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a, but you would, our capacity is pretty stretched, frankly, in terms of time, but how to that you can go. Yeah. Because companies will also have clinicians. A lot of the larger companies will have clinicians as part of their own health and safety and home sort of staff well being. So yes. that could be another pain point just in terms of. You know, capacity. And, yes. And, and I think the idea of getting the defibrillator donations. Yeah. It seems to me it could be a, a really lucrative yeah. market. Yeah. Indeed. Um, yeah, along with blood transfusion at the same time and yes, blood. Yeah. And sorry, Fanal, I just had a question on the health and safety. And um, there's a mention here, um, we talk about the physical assaults, there's a mention of work is progressing through a new body arm. Is that body arm? What's the body arm? Is that going to actually make a difference? Because we already have the body one camera, so I'm trying to understand. So I think that refers to the replacement. So oh. the um, stab vests that we have. Okay. Are, oh, so so we've had just... quite a long time, so it's procuring uh, newer, lighter models of. Uh, Fine. Okay, hit. so it makes it easier for us yeah. to stop. And then, sorry, for one final question. Sorry, just on the 111. Integrated urgent care, number of incidents. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reference here to a subcategory around call handling, and mainly um, our times the, the recording of the demographics and some errors in the recording. But just curious as to is there any automated solution that could sort of resolve that in some so ways? It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Mm -hmm. right. So, one of the bits of tech you can see. It's, since most people don't want one on their mobile phone. Yes, you pick up the number. No, we will stay able to lift all of the demographics on the mobile phone as yes. opposed to us. Uh, and the way of doing that, <laughs> so they link to the mobile phone. If uh, the other person is queuing, you ask them, can you complete it? Subject. And all they have to press is OK, and then the vote sends it. Yes. Uh, so they've given their consent by pressing OK. 
Um, so you get around that, but we need a little upgrade in our tech before we can do that. Right. Rumble, please. Um, thank you. Um, um, just, just a question for Nella on uh, overdue incidents. Um, I, I just noticed over 50% of them, I think, are patient incidents, and I just wondered what's what's in that backlog? Do we know? So uh, the incidents that are graded are no, uh, low harm, moderate harm, and severe harm and death. Everything that is graded moderate, severe and death is looked at immediately through the uh, local patient safety groups that happen weekly and feed into um, a uh, once a week meeting that Pauline and I chair to review the um, serious incidents. The others are uh, are low harm where um, there is uh, no immediate harm to the patient being identified, but learning potential is there and that's picked up through the incident learning group. Um, that being said, the position of having that many unopened and unresolved is something that we're very focused on resolving and having a system in place for the next financial year where we, we have not got that backlog. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Under health and safety, there's a comment down 686 physical assaults. And while you pointed out that a lot of those are related to the physical condition of the patient, that still leaves 294 that weren't. And we have 14 prosecutions, which is 2% of the sorts of the number of prosecution, which is better than it used to be, but is still much, much lower than it should be. And we hope that body worn cameras would be able to contribute to So I don't know whether we have evidence that the body worn cameras contributed to the 14 prosecutions or what else are we doing to try to address this? So we do have evidence that, that it's contributed in some cases, um, and I think what's what it has also helped is to encourage more staff to use the one on cameras. So uh, seeing the benefit, seeing the, the opportunity to sometimes de-escalate incidents um, that the one on cameras have assisted in. I, I agree, fourteen is a a small number. It's often quite difficult to follow up with the prosecution for a whole host of reasons. Police yeah, attended a large number of them, so you would hope. That be doing better. Yes, uh, well I would hope we'd be doing better. I would hope we'd see as many of our staff being assaulted. Um, I guess you know it's it's not straightforward often. Um, I can certainly follow up um, and perhaps bring down a better breakdown in the next um, in the next report as to how much interaction we've managed to progress. I know the team are very busy and it's quite a small team that we currently have working through that on and they follow up on every case that they can with people that come to police. But you can get copied into most of the data yeah. is uh, I think the number of prosecutable cases is quite low because nearly always there is a medical condition that is underlying the patient behaving very inappropriately, uh, which I think makes the prosecution quite hard. Um, so it's just a sceptical look. <laughs> well, that's what when you read the data, it's that that's medical condition. Yeah, well, yeah, it's less that. And it's there's a lot of them. Yeah, there is a there is a lot of that. That shouldn't be a mitigation against the No, no, but I don't think that is. But on the one, I don't. Yeah, get, I just I don't get very many of the ones that are well, patient is from the love getting the ones where generally it's a mental health issue that is the issue rather than the person being broken. So we'd like to know a bit more. Yeah, so back and pace. Um, so I have a question about the health inequalities uh, section, particularly around the plus Y priorities, and then you could expand on the criteria that we'll use to get the longest of patients, and whether we have sufficient data within our systems to actually help us deliver what we're trying to do with inequalities or are there any gaps in the data that we need to shine a light on? Um, so there are gaps in data and what, 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 we're, what, what we're trying to do is identify um, a, a small number of group groups of patients who we think are impacted by health inequalities where we can make a difference. We had a workshop on this last week and we had to say it was extraordinarily informative. 
staff work from all different bits of the organisation and lots of creativity and thinking about how we might provide better care for children, better care for mental, people with mental health conditions, etc. Um, and we've made a start, as Vanilla suggested, for sickle cell. That was the first one we went for. There was a lot of consensus that we wanted to go on after uh, and go, go, go for that particular condition. Um, but significantly, so Vanilla and champion that. So we had that session of the weekend in Croydon with patients um, impacted by sickle cell, which I think people found extremely informative in terms of what those patients were needing, their experience of the system, and how they were communicating with. So we've got kind of proof of concept, I suppose, that listening to the cohort of patients was definitely the right thing to do. And this exercise is to find other groups of patients that we want to do that with. We're going to do all of them in one go because of great amount of different groups. On data, our um, they, we don't have work data um, in this area, and we are trying to improve that data by getting access to what the NHS actually collects on um, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an issue that exists outside this organisation, but we're actively talking in NHS England and others about how we can improve the flow of data into our organisation so we can do better analysis of how we factor our how our services and when the government is interrelate. In terms of data, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of it's beyond our control. It necessitates a challenge, I think, of all NHS, but within the scope of our control, is there anything we can support with in terms of data collection, in terms of outcomes, for example, for people with sickle cell or anything else? Yeah, I mean, we'll be doing more analysis yeah. on all of those different areas. So as well as, well as so we think the first step is to identify mm -hmm. the initial cohorts of patients we want to know that we look at, and then we'll look at the data that we have to support that, plus, plus raising the patient voice and then seeing what that adds up to. We'll bring all of that information back to the discussion. So, Roger, just building on Shara's point, um, I mean, we, we, we very intentionally um, asked that the digital strategy becomes the digital and data strategy. So it, it, what you're describing, is that going to be included in the data strategy when we eventually see that element of the, the work that's being delivered? Yes. As fair as yes. leading. Yes, we'll, 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 we'll make sure we can come here to us. I think it's massively strategic, and that's why I think it'd be really great to see a joined up sort of mm -hmm. strategy not just for the digital piece, but also for the data piece, and not just in the delivery of data, but actually exactly as you were saying, the mining and how we can use data to actually benefit the wider system as well as have greater insight on our patient report. I think just one thing to add, I mean, I suppose we'll have noted in my paper, the yeah. EDR committee, we're expanding the scope of that yeah. committee to include health and I saw that, yes. But we actually need to show us where the data yes. elements of that is going to sit. Really, there is going to be more of a focus on it through that committee. Yeah. Yes, and I'm just, yeah. very, just anticipating that that committee will say, show us the data. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that yeah. we're, we're expecting. But it's, I mean, single cell is an interesting case because the outcome is unlikely to be any difference in the attendance to hospital or anything like that. Should they improve patient satisfaction, it will probably be better use of analgesics. Those are things we can measure once we have all keys. Certainly, there are that. Mark, uh, I've seen my reports and I've had a chance to read it. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Uh, Damien, please. Thank you. Um, so, we do a bit, a bit on the staff survey. Um, you, colleagues would know we discussed this in prior field by the embargo, which is why it's not the piece is assured because the embargo obviously happens much later. But now it is in the public domain. We're very pleased to announce we made significant progress in all the people promises. On page 74, the first page of my report, you can see a sea of green, which um which is fantastic for us. I think last year we started to see green shoots. And now we're seeing the fruits of our labour to some extent. 
So of the 97 questions, we improved in 90 of them. There were noteworthy improvements in teamwork leadership and learning development. That's on the backdrop of a response rate of 68.4%, which is the highest in the sector. I mean, it's only one behind the highest in the acute sector. So I think what we're demonstrating is our true start gain voice um, with over 5,000 people feeding back this year. Um, we did decline on seven questions. Uh, arguably, statistical relevance was it was 0.01 to 2%. But that said, I think we were disappointed to fall behind on some of our key objectives, namely around discrimination and harassment. There was certainly work to be done in that respect. Um, I should also call out this was the first time that the NHS introduced the sexual safety question with respect to staff and staff um, sexual safety harassment and also with respect to our colleagues receiving harassment on our patients. And it's widely reported this is a particular problem in the ambulance sector and we've been quite brave talking about it um, and taking action on it. A zero tolerance stance um, is widely accredited as an exemplar of practice. We developed our own sexual change charter three years before the NHS England was came out by interest this year. And in there you'll see a wide range of interventions that we have done or planning to do going forward. However, um, it goes without saying this is a form of harassment that is most concerning to us. We are working very hard to eliminate that. Um, and it's very hard workplace, a great place to work. Um, before I go into BAE, I want to know if you want to stop or we'll start selling. Just to congratulate you. I'm sure there's all the same thing. Yes, I mean, I think I was going to say the one of the I said it when we talked about this in, in, in private. I mean, certainly in my experience, this is astonishing, this level of, of improvement. And again, you know, we haven't said it, but again, against a backdrop of industrial action. Um, so against that backdrop and the national implementation of that backdrop to get this level of improvement, um, I think is 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 really, really commendable. So just I think that's the Yeah, well done. Well done, all of them. Because a good team at the visibility across the trust. I just wanted to comment that Daniel and I went all down the long way yesterday, and uh, Daniel was leaving a session all around the city. So, our commissions there, uh, uh, and uh, the thing that really came out of that was the importance of team based work here and the and the conversations that were being had, and also the relationship with the direct line manager, which are both things we're specifically taking steps on over the past year or so. And that was that was coming, you know, directly to us from it. Like those were two critical factors in terms of starting the yeah. And just one point from me, I think it's just to commend as well. I think the actually starting the conversation around sexual safety and having those open discussions i think is really helpful because you've got to put it on the table you've got to listen and it causes people to reflect and i think that's been really interesting and um, damien i had a question i don't know where to ask it but on this anti-racism charter is this the right time or do i wait for it <laughs> Well, I can probably also hold on to my question, but um, I, uh, well, I'll just as I've got the floor, I'll ask it now. <laughs> um, the, the the commendable number of initiatives on sexual safety, I mean, it's great to see. Can we, can we do some, or are we doing something similar on discrimination and harassment? Because that's an area that we haven't done so well in. Yeah, in fact, I'll I'll pick that question up when I finish my report. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Um, just briefly, in terms of business as usual, recruitment, um, as you've heard throughout today, very strong brands, very strong pipelines, and then we reduced the back in that respect. So I won't go through the details, um, but you can see uh, we are now filling all our vacancies and we've got less than 5%. In addition, we've just returned from Australia and we have a smaller number than we did last year. And that's a reflection of stabilising our workforce model and, and reducing our international dependency. Um, all the other uh, all recruitment activities captured in the report. Just to flag absence saw a small improvement in February, but it's much improved in March. 
And now what we're seeing with so is we've introduced some pilots about local reporting mechanisms that went live this week. But that's again a building a culture of empowering our managers looking to devolve some of the central control um, to have better outcomes for our staff and managers. And linked to that is the scheduling team. They're on a transformation program and it's detailed in there with a similar notion of empowering managers. And finally, the OD team, various pieces of activity, but picking up on uh, Ronald's uh, question, we are now doing a cross reference between the um, the cultural, the national cultural review recommendations, what our gaps are, what we're strong at, essentially a SWOT analysis. And I think the um, focus needs to relook really about how we're doing our ESPA um, across all the protected domains. Because whilst we are having, um, we, we put as much energy in, but we haven't seen as much positive outcomes across all the domains. And I think that is a, a good, a good point to say we need to stop and take some serious look at how, what's working and what isn't. So there's a, a stop point in place. That makes sense. Amy, I have just a question on the scheduling transformation because I also read in Alan's report that there's potentially a new tool as well. Now, in our D and DQ Digital and Data Quality Committee, we also talked about the call sign changes and all the bespoke integration that's occurred in some of those systems, including GRS. So I'm just trying to make, connect the dots. Is what comes first? I mean, is there a connection between? No, OK, between what Claire is doing. So um, we've got one program to say we have central scheduling. Now we have team space working. That okay. seems like the right operating model. Let's devolve scheduling. Okay. We have one piece of work which says, should we replace the scheduling system? But we put that on hold essentially okay. because the piece of work which says are we booking people onto yes. vehicles with the, with the staff or the vehicle as the id that's what came to your committee yes. to say can you change that one yeah until you change that one you can't change the church yeah. that's what i was hoping you'd say and i wasn't clear on no, but, yes apologies we're doing all the hard work we're sure to identify what's available on the market we say to, but as dan was saying they will follow yes in line with what claire's vision is Okay, it'd be good to see that on Claire's role. Yeah. It does feed into. Yes, uh, yeah. it does. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. And please. Yeah. Um, so, a few few things. I think people have talked about the, the continued strong performance of recruitment. Um, one thing to, uh, a couple of things to, to, to just mention on um, resourcing. We've been having a focus as a committee on stability, i.e. that in a London market, what we're aiming to do is to simply increase the amount of time people spending in role. Because typically in London, you have um, a younger workforce. You will be more mobile. You may well move out of London at certain points in, in their lives. Um, and actually, a more realistic measure is not necessarily only turnover, but to increase the stability, the length of time he stays in a job. So we're starting to look at that by different different areas, and you'll see that we've started to see an increase in 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 a stay measures in a, the length of time he stays in in post, which is is positive, and that's been supported by the stay. Um, conversations that have been happening so try, trying to understand what is it that makes people stay or what is it that makes them want to go uh, and it won't be a surprise to people but in 999 and one every single conversation of the list was paid um, and so part of that you know we don't have control over but it does speak to thinking about um, more active management of careers um, yeah, in that. The other thing that uh, came up was uh, shift work and rotors. Um, and this is becoming more of an issue with a younger generation who are wanting much more flexibility about how they how they work. Um, so that information is going to be used to start to think about how we can increase the stability. And of the uh, career pathways, I remember last time I reported 
that it had been agreed that we would target a new uh, pilot EOC going to AAP, the particular strategy of targeting staff from the BME backgrounds. Um, and the aim was to get 50% of people applying to um, be from those backgrounds. Um, that's now underway. Um, over 100 colleagues have uh, uh, come to events. Uh, that's at least 50% were from the targeted background. Um, and so we're optimistic that, that we're going to see uh, a step change uh, in that, that regard. And so we can be clear about what we mean by that. What we're aiming to do is that when people are interviewed, we have two candidates, one from the main background and one from the non main background, and it's absolutely evident that they are equivalent, and we will positively go see the same background, but we need to be clear that there's that absolute level playing field. So that's what we're aiming to do. Scheduling you just mentioned, and the only thing I don't think you, you called out is the cost of the potential increase of the cloud-based solution that we've spent some time. So the current uh, uh, scheme is going to a cloud-based solution. And I couldn't remember how much extra it's going to be, but it's extremely significant. Extremely significant. And so we spent some time, and it may be something your committee can help us with. Yeah, it hasn't come up with. The committee was trying to understand what, what, why a cloud-based solution would be so much more expensive, because that's a significant risk to our schedule. But the scheduling package was well, actually. Well, it's, it's, it's a really no commercial thing here, right? We yeah. have a we have a product from a vendor. Yes. They're basically increasing the license fee massively. And yeah. They're saying they're doing that because it's not in the cloud. Yeah. There's no logic to that. Yeah. But you have to make a commercial decision about whether we want to keep with that package or right. not. So it's not a good yes. yeah. But it's a risk at the moment while we're doing the, the work about what we want to do. Yes. It's a risk. Well, it's like an inevitable. Like, there's a negotiation to be had, but we. Yeah. But, well, we'd, we'd be very happy to receive yeah. the report on it uh, from the fair or whoever. Yeah. Yeah. Our um, committee could certainly. I'll certainly tell you the action as well. If we're doing those business and... Yeah. We'd be happy to, to take a look. Yeah. And the only other thing I was just going to highlight was that um, we were due to have, but colleagues remember that on the culture programme, the committee had been, I guess, challenging exact to. Um, be more ambitious in terms of retaking all the culture transformation. I have to say that's been that's been wetted by the increase on the staff survey to want to do more than that. So the ODT came and presented a very good outline of what the future culture uh, an OT program had been. We couldn't do it justice, so we've agreed that we would deep dive into that at the next committee. And I'm subject to that would suggest it is something that should come back to a development day. I have a question just, um, just on the attrition um, in 111 and 999. Um, how, do we have a do we have a range we're aiming for? Because it's 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 a classic area that you're going to have yes, exactly. so, yeah. to what we've been asking. That's yeah. yeah. the exact challenge. Yes. Right. Your traditional KPI. Yeah. We're never going to achieve no. that. So you need to rebase. We're trying to rebase the model. So our work lines and our ones have simply they've come down hugely. Um, it's about stabilizing it and benchmarking more in that exercise yet and working out what is the capability commission goes to. Okay. And just in terms of the ship work and rotors, now I have to differentiate between the nines and the ones. But I do think again there's a technology play of ones that could facilitate. Some of that greater flexibility for perhaps the workforce in terms of not necessarily having to physically come in at certain hours and being able to operate differently, and then looking at a different model, so, a different resourcing model. So the the evidence of no working in the ones some providers have tried to do it. it it's not good. So it's very hard to manage products in the scene of only if you are in the call centers. And you also get the problem of when the person gets a very difficult patient, actually getting the support to them at home in a timely yeah. basis is much harder than it is when they're in an environment with other people. Um, 
what's interesting is the rotors that we have in the ones are very different to the rotors we have in the nines. So the ones come from a much more, uh, so much younger workforce who are much more willing to work shorter numbers of hours and times a day to suit them, which generally is in very nicely with the call volumes. Whereas in the nines format, they have been a much more traditional, almost like an ambulance rotor for a very long period of time. And that getting away from that to something that is more like the ones, it's a very hard piece of work, but we're making quite good progress. So um, I'll take the report as a and people have seen there was a lot of progress against the the uh, ETR range progress report. A couple of things just to highlight from the report that the committee um, being aware of. Um, so we took the gender female report and there was really quite positive progress on that, but we had quite an important conversation. Um, when you look at, for example, um, the fourth bullet, uh, when we're seeing um, less uh, women uh, being pointed to 8A, 8B, 8D, BSM, and so it's quite an important conversation about returning AAPs and paramedics from maternity leave and colleagues raising the issue that the reality is that our shift patterns are very difficult to manage if you are somebody returning from, from that and you have, uh, in this case, child caring and the other types of care responsibility. And so we agree that a single piece of work should be done to look at that and we you were going to take that take that forward, you might also speak about that in a moment. Um, and then uh, I'll come to the anti-discrimination state in a moment, because I'm not, not just to talk to that. And as I mentioned earlier, we took new terms of reference, um, which expanded the uh, scope of the committee to include health inequalities and to reflect that in uh, not only just its scope, but also its, its membership. And there was an action here that, that was shared with you. Obviously, you've, 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 you've seen it. Well, is there any more to add to the? Uh, it, well, just to follow on, really, um, we've got some views about what we think the barriers are, but actually what we want to do is really just explore them uh, through the women's network um, and also through uh, with Carmen as she's starting to establish the um, BME uh, leaders uh, group just to really understand what are the barriers because I think some of them are perceived in some of the language that puts people off replying so they don't actually exist it's just a sense or a feeling that I can't do that role because I have caring responsibilities so um, we've committed to take back uh, where we got to in terms of the work in July um, and that's already established with Vanessa as our chair of the women's network and then the last thing um, which and my report is coming to this uh, committee um, for consideration of that agreement is uh, the anti-discrimination statement and anti-racism chart, which we discussed. If you want to just, yes. it's appended to my report. Yes, they're both, they're, they're both appended there. I think it was just by way of context. Since this, since the uh, EDI committee started, we have tried to take a look at steps in a range of different areas that have been discussed in this meeting, including, for example, getting on top of our data, making sure that is more widely shared with the organisation, doing the work that we're doing on the significant number of inclusion work, work, um, workshops, uh, trying to be better at reasonable adjustments, looking at our interview processes to make sure they are more uh, in more environment independent, understanding why we've got more um, people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds going into our disciplinary processes, etc. So that this is part of the package. But these these two particular pieces are a build on something you've seen before. So the first uh, and they're important symbols I want to share around the organization and what they're about. Um, now, we have already got the, 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 the first bit of the anti-discrimination that we've already got, that's already published on our website. 
So this is a bit of an upgrade. It builds on that statement by adding in some statements about what we expect of individuals around the organization and what we expect of our organization. So it's a, it's a strengthening of the existing anti-discrimination statement. And our idea is that that will sit as, as the overarching thing, but underneath that, we may have a number of different charters. Obviously, as Damien mentioned, we've already got the um, sexual safety charter, which was launched two years ago. And we're now wanting to add to that a specific charter on the topic of racism because it is such an important mm -hmm. topic. Um, and again, uh, in the on the anti-racism charter, it, it says something about our responsibilities in relation to that topic. And the words I think are self-explanatory, and we're seeking the board support uh, to take these statement, statements forward and publish them and share them through the organisation. Had a question on that. Does that apply to third party suppliers? Um, <laughs> yes. Well, funnily enough, we, we, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but we obviously we, do, we have said that we want to want to think carefully about the responsibilities we want to put on the suppliers uh, as part of uh, you know, our work to make sure that everything we do contributes to the health problem. Um, so yeah, we, could, we for, could for anyone engaging we could consider us that probably just need to be clear on right. thing. Uh, when we say anyone engaging with OAS, yeah. you, is anyone also a supplier? Or are aware of recent high profile? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then how do we goal. communicate that to our suppliers if they were in the scope? And if they're not in the scope, we probably need to be clear with that. Yes, we could ask them to sign a statement or something. Yeah. How does this? What's the fundamental difference with the statement that the shot? Uh, so the the statement is more about statement is about one thing discrimination on it as a gender disability. It is on uh, and this and the other one's specifically about racism. Specific one about racism in the future. Racism is the same. Yeah. So we you all I can. See where you're thinking, this we clear about how they all fit together. Yeah, and you're that point. Yeah, and, and then there's a style that shows an alignment of all things. Just, I'll try to think more. We've got some more to come, haven't we, to fit under this? I well, haven't made a reason that we could do that if it was on board. Uh, <coughs> people wanted to send that on to Yeah, yeah. that's my desire is also to keep things simple. Yeah, you know, and uh, I've asked about like, like strategies, the first strategy we want. I want to be able to, when we put things on walls or talk to people about things, be really clear about what he's going to say. Why one thing is either building on or different to the other. Are we clear about that, are we? Then, so, so, so we started with one on the sexual safety. That was the thing about three years ago. Then we ended up wanting to do one on racial discrimination. And, and then you get, well, the problem is that there's other forms of discrimination too. Yeah. So I think you have to have an overall statement about discrimination that covers everything. Mm -hmm. But when you say it covers everything, then it isn't specific. And uh, there is also a requirement to be specific in certain areas. So I think you end up with needing an overarching statement and specific charters for different types of discrimination. Everyone very clear in mind about what we're trying to do. Otherwise, you just get into this debate which says you'd be too specific here and you'd be too general there. I think you need yes, to have that. That's exactly is what the feedback is on. So, it does say is this aligns to the sexual safety of the child? Yeah, the racist child. I'd rather you have seen first. Yeah, uh, so we all think this all fits together. Yeah, right. But we have to be could be clearer. But the theory is this it fits together. Yeah, and maybe and that's like just even the presentation look. Yeah, I'll tell you that. Yeah, that's what you should be around. Yeah, so just so it makes sense to be. When I don't talk to people, I mean, like something you can say, this is it, it's really clear what we're trying to say to people. Yeah, that's it. Um, the question, just to expand on <coughs> Sheila's point um, and suppliers, and how do we provide assurance for ourselves and to our organisation that we 
do have a system of all these supplies to account. Because, I mean, there are <clears throat> bits and proper persons' tips. And what applies to us should also apply to the people we work with and contract with. Yeah. So, because we can't really have a double standard where we hold ourselves to one set of standards and then we don't hold our yeah. people that we're going so to expecting our suppliers to be improving each of the others. I think, remember, yeah. I mean, I think it depends on what sort of we're talking about. For example, if you just go onto a framework um, for cool down the NHS, all of this is known. You have to be pretty precise to get onto a framework for the NHS against all of these, these areas. Um, when there's smaller one off suppliers, like, you know, that's more of an issue, but when you've got one off suppliers, that's a few good. Yes, I mean, anyone who's um, submitted a tender or has had to produce short statements on things like modern slavery, yeah. uh, carbon reduction, yeah. and union yeah. or something, or um, promoting the quality of their own. Should we be monitoring those in the pay gap? That's the place. For example. Well, that's us. Uh, 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 Check that. But I think there is a grey area where you do one on procurement, if that makes sense, for a smaller piece of work. But, but if it's an organisation, this is important, then you can see why they have a large consultancy for London and how we encourage change elsewhere. Yeah. It's a nearly all our procurement we do through nationally agreed frameworks where all of this is set out and the suppliers have to conform to a whole heap of standards before you can get onto the framework. We do very little off framework procurement because do we think the framework is really done? Well, but basically that's not our choice, is it? Because they're normally government negotiated frameworks that you are working on. And the biggest one is for our commercial services. So I, I kind of think there's, there's a limit to how far you can go as an individual organisation in this space. I guess my point was more about, you know, it's all very well to do it in frameworks, and I think that's fair and reasonable that suppliers will sign on to those frameworks and whatever the criteria are. But this is a, a, an extra thing we're doing here, and anybody who touches us should be aware that this charter exists. I guess that was my point. And I think we need to be clearer about that, or clearer perhaps than this charter indicates at the moment, because that's a reinforcing message, and it's over and above what I signed up to in framework. In my opinion. And just one other small point. I mean, I just wondered whether signatures would be. Up. That's it's going okay. to you on. You're going to. Yes, subject to subject to this conversation. Signatures with you, man. Signatures actually. So it's lovely to have this charter. Yeah, I was just puzzled. The first one didn't have anything that yeah. names on the second one. Did. It was just, yeah. I suppose it's a style issue of what is it saying. Um, yeah. My mum was, I've got to be angry because I thought one Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any more on that? You're supposed to be angry or angry. Um, that for form of one. See, that's the actual one. Yeah, no QPM either. Um, right. Yeah. Anything more? I'm just showing you up because I've got no Oh, yeah, I'm sure you've got one. Um, right, anything else? Anything else? Yeah. Thanks ever so much indeed. Thank you. But I need a cup of tea. Do you mind if we have a really quick break? Yes. We're back yeah, and let's yeah. change the order a little bit, please. We go on to, um, I've got here digital and digital. Yeah, digital and data quality committee. Um, so my report, um, I'll take it as read. Um, but I just will draw out a couple of things. Um, first one, we referenced it already earlier in the meeting, is um, the report we received on the uh, changing out of the dynamic allocation of call signs when booking resources onto shifts to actually more aligning with the national standard in most other ambulance trusts, which is to use the uh, allocate the call sign to the actual vehicle itself. And so that will be quite a transformational change. And um, we've had opportunities to do, do that in the past with other systems changes. 
but we haven't been able to achieve it. So this time, um, the exec has made the decision aligned with the Chief Digital Officer's strategy to standardise on processes rather than bespoking our IT systems to uh, look at a standard method, which would mean that we will need to unravel some of the changes that have been made to some of our existing systems, the scheduling tool, the airwaves tool, the um, computer aided dispatch tool. So the next step on this is to produce a report that outlines, you know, what's involved, what the impact will be on our processes, our people and our technology systems. And my understanding is that that will come back to the Digital and Data Quality Committee, possibly in the May time frame, Daniel, I think, depending on how soon uh, that work can be done. So I think that's a very significant change, uh, but a very positive one because it will allow us in the future to take advantage of national solutions. Whereas at the moment, our strategy has somewhat been, we take part of the solution, but then we look for some changes to that solution to fit with our way of working. So this is quite a departure, but in a positive way. So I think quite a bit of work to be done to get us to that point, but I think it would be very useful. Hence the question around the scheduling system, because I think we need to understand what the process changes are here and then link that to the scheduling system. Um, the other thing, just to say, we, we reviewed uh, two reports uh, on data quality. One was on the computer aid dispatch system. And then we also received a report on um, three metrics that are very important metrics supporting the business intelligence report, some of which we receive here, such as here and treat uh, percentage rates. Um, I won't go through the details on those, but just to say that um, it, 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 they were very detailed reports. Um, a lot of effort has gone in from the data quality team to produce those reports and do the analysis. And I think really represents a very strong capability we have in that team. Um, what did emerge was in terms of um, assurance that on the substantive areas of insurance, such as the assurance, such as the validity of the data, the completeness of the data, particularly in CAD, uh, that assurance was quite strong, so significant improvements or significant assurance with minor improvements. However, one big theme that emerged from both reports was that there's still quite a bit of work to be done around improving our processes. So that would be things like, do we have the right change control procedures in place when we make changes to systems so we understand the impact on our data? Uh, there are some challenges around data entry at the point of um, the actual entry point for that data and then causing errors later on in, in and those having to be resolved further in the system. Uh, there are issues around documentation not being up to date, uh, issues around making sure that when we do change a system and we understand the data flows, that we're reflecting that in our training materials. So a lot of really good uh, insights that emerge from it. And uh, in the CAD report in particular, I didn't mention this in my report, but there are 17 um, actions that have been identified or recommendations of which 10 were deemed to be of uh, high, high impact. So the team is putting together a, an action plan to address those. Now, I think this links back to the Veritas C1 report that we received and the need for us to continue to remain vigilant around these deep dives into various systems, surfacing gaps we see, and then being able to make the link between those gaps and changes we need to make in terms of our data processes and also changes we need to make in terms of our governance arrangements around those data processes. Um, and I think that's also critically important, particularly if we think about the strategic use of data that we discussed earlier. We've got to get it right at the source. We've got to make sure that it remains um, um, the single source of the truth as we go through the various systems. So I think that's what we're uncovering with uh, some of this work. Um, and then finally, just to mention that we did review some of our risks. Um, we didn't re review one risk, which is 1.5, and that was largely because the lead executive, Pauline, was on holiday. So uh, we said we would review that and we'd ask Pauline to take that away um, and completely, I think, review the risk, update it, including the controls and the actions. The other two risks we reviewed, we kept the scores as they are for the moment but we will look at reducing the scores, particularly on the MDT rollout, possibly in the summer, once we get to over 50% of the uh, MDT implementation. That's the mobile data terminal implementation. So any questions?
And to start saying thank you. I mean, it's a densely challenging set of papers sometimes. Isn't it? They are. Um, <laughs> really it, uh, um, I mean, it really is very, very technical, some of it. And I think a lot of well done for the Institute. Thank you. It's an awful lot here. And, and it is Michael Shield. Just to add to that, I wasn't able to join the um, subcommittee because it wasn't very well, but I did go through the papers. So I agree with what you said. I think it is very technical at different points. As a clinician, I think what was useful was always to ask the so what question here. Yeah. So, this, you know, what are the implications of what we're trying to do here in terms of data quality, data entry? And I suppose that's where we need the clinical voices and the clinical leadership, you know, for the Infinella and others and our CC on your own. To really be an active part of this and taking this forward so that we understand the clinical risks around the gap and particularly the bank risks around data, the three bank risks, and then we're actually, like, actually able to articulate the clinical impact of those risks really clearly. So yeah. I think you know it's a lot of work to be done, but um, I think with the appointment of our CCIO, we we'll can probably start making a lot of headway on that with our senior clinicians as well. Yeah, and I'm sure I had a good a good um, advice this morning when she and I caught up, but just because the report at the moment, um, it highlights, you know, the gaps in processes and the gaps in controls, et cetera. But we think it'd be also helpful to have a, a column that talks to any clinical impact on that, which I think would complete the report. So it's something I'll feedback through you, Pauline, in terms of your team and the work they do in producing those reports because we're in it's an early it's an early piece of work and the next report will be on the electronic patient care records system so i think the team is really getting into its stride but we do need to look at perhaps just elevating the reports a level so that we can understand them and understand the lead points as you say mm -hmm. okay so there was an issue about over 10 yeah and uh, no this was in terms of just the way the reports are produced i mean we do need to resolve um, gaps in attendance as well, but I'll pick that up with um, with Daniel and okay. um, when I well, discussed. No, again, I'm, I'm very grateful for sure. But you say nothing else. Go on. We'll go back to um, finance. Thanks. So, so my finance director will put it up. Just go through the headlines of the various steps of all of them are evening. So, uh, first part of the report. Uh, Looks at the period end of January, we'll be posting a small sale course as a member one from the forecast to break even in the year. Um, the year ends in the previous time, so we'll be really well with busy gearing up the year end. Capital program, then the current track to deliver a spend a total of million pounds. We did actually get uh, more. Capital towards the end of the year, which was spent as well, so I don't know what the million pounds. The other areas within strategic assets, that is of fleet, the investment we made around uh, 429 odd double crude ambulances, that has now resulted in we've now increased our fleet by uh, 50, by 35 acres a day. Those ambulances are now being rolled out to. Um, Conversations of personal use. Uh, and we're now looking to the commission of non leaders of non leaders And also reviewing whether or not we need, we need to increase our fleet further still. And you can see we rolled out of more hybrid on uh, electric cars, fully electric cars as well. We'll use the, the capital money you've got here to it's, um, see the all the detail that the stuff we don't have around the environment and having stations and uh, um, upgrading the stations and increasing the size. So we now occupy the uh, one half of the full, full uh, new on the site. So that's now ready to go. One part of it now, all the labels we can use. And another area of will now be ready in fact, the next few weeks for more education. Facilities and meeting rooms and break and um and and just space effort. So that's that's obviously a logistics again. So we're rolling out. It has been difficult, I have to say, to get the make ready start to use the scanning app, old house scanning app, which um despite training and a number of 
incentives to try and get that, but slowly that is good, but is enough to get used to that upgrade, and that allows us to prep our equipment. Uh, I think this is one success story is the what I many equipment technicians. So we now have three. They've gone on a number of a series of program, um, like training programs, strike by uh, other companies, and we now do a lot of other things in the house, which is a significant financial state. We've got more economy turn out times of the case as well. So that's uh that's important. Uh sustainability those are the three to three projects of the coming to finance and report uh progress against that. Um <clears throat> so we're now developing refreshing the plat the strategy and developing these for plan to twenty four twenty five. Make ready uh we talked about the fixed fleet or table fleet and the school is now live in all five sec uh, four or five sectors. Um uh, and we're now um reviewing and seeing best on the from the new sector before. Uh, and importantly, uh I'll make ready uh staff will be transitioning to the full of check and here's the way so we'll the day it's very well to that's the plan as well. So that's a significant piece of work. Also, any questions for the question? No. No? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, Bob, this is. Um, uh, uh, Rommel, are you reporting on any of Bob, Bob's reports? Um, I can say something if you like, which probably also uh, segues into the Audit Committee update, um, if that would be helpful. I guess the the main point which you kind of raised in your London chairs update, Andy, was something I'm witnessing elsewhere. I mean, the, the NHS, I think, squaring demand and resource is is a is a big concern, and I think most of the acute boards and at the integrated care system level, all of the discussions are about budget. So <laughs> we spent a lot of time at the finance committee, I think, going through. Uh, 24 25 budget and again at audit committee no noted the significant risk around um going into next year um so i think that's what i would say about uh what the point i would call out from the discussion at finance committee i don't know if sheila wants to add anything else no i think other than we we had a very robust discussion around um some of the productivity improvement and the you know the, the the SIPs, and there's more work to do, and that's going to come back. I think before the May submission or after the May submission. Okay, anything else on finance twenty twenty four? If not, all it then, please. Well. Okay, well I'll keep going. Um, so um, I guess one thing to highlight: we've kicked off um, what I'm calling thought leadership sessions uh, from our auditors. And uh, there was a really helpful uh, session on um, actually on equality, diversity and inclusion. And given um, the previous discussions we've just had about the uh, discrimination and um, ra racism statement, etc. I think and Damien's point about needing to take stock, uh, what this session highlighted was it would inform actually it would be quite helpful to inform a gap analysis and an internal audit later this year. So I was going to suggest, um, Roger, as you firm up the scope of the internal audit, um, that I think um, Anne has a good look look at that, and and it may help the work you're doing, Anne, in the in the EDI committee. So just just to highlight that as a point of uh, taking forward, and um, I guess also to note that um, given the importance of value for money. One of the other things we've asked for from the external auditors at our next session, and I'm sort of mentioning this to the board. So if if people are interested, you're all welcome to attend. It's only half an hour. Um, the auditors are going to give us a, their approach to how they undertake audits, but also particularly focused on value for money. Um, so anyway, just just for that to, to, to note that. Um, I think the audit committee noted good progress on. Um, reducing risk scores I and mean, I think we can see that later in Mark's paper or I think he presents a round robin on everybody's uh, um, heavy lifting that the committees are doing on risk which again is very good work so I think the way the governance is working 
is is um, is actually good to see. Um, and then looking ahead, I mean, I've already picked out the significant 24-25 financial risks. But I think just a comment on, I guess, some of the short and medium term pressures that the organization is facing, both in terms of finances, but also performance. Um, and to note that frontline operations in particular are all embarked on major change. So the EOC, the 111 ambulance ops, um, the NARU onboarding, you know, resilience special assets, the South Ambulance collaboration that we talked about earlier, and some of the work that Sheila has been looking at and through her committee, lots of IT change. So there's just a, a, a bit of a caution there to watch the kind of aggregation risk around all of that stuff that's going on um, with everything else that's also going on externally that we can't control. Uh, so I think audit committee was just noting that. Um, we, we, we take our usual update on cyber security and what is our stance, which um, you know, will remain an ongoing threat. Um, and I noticed, I know that the NHS is continually under threat from the Russians in particular, but other state um, sponsors, shall we say. So um, that, that will continue to remain on our radar. Um, and there's, there's an update on information governance, which links back to you know, the, the, the protection of data which I think Mark will pick up in his report, but we have a general update from Mark as the CSIRO uh, at every audit committee. Um, and then just in terms of um, some of the issues that have hit the NHS, but obviously you're all aware of the Lucy Letby situation and how freedom to speak up has come to be a real um, point of discussion at boards. Um, so it was good to know that we took, a, a, we, the internal audit, uh, reported findings on the freedom to speak up arrangements as being actually quite good um it's a good assurance on both design and effectiveness and uh, we also looked at uh, the need to perhaps complement some of our internal audit program with um, deep dives uh, so rakesh and the team are looking at maybe for example we may want to look at make ready as as one of the areas just to give us some more assurance on <coughs> excuse me and in that context, we also asked for the internal audit uh, plans to be finalized and to be brought back. Um, um, and then part of that point about the thought leadership sessions is to get, actually get more out of our auditors. So the audit committee's self-assessment, which you also took a report on, I think highlighted, uh, could our auditors be more discerning and can we get more value from them? So uh, hopefully some of these sessions will 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 lead to that. And then the final point, uh, just for board to note, um, I guess in the context of uh, changes that may or may not happen at the ICS level, we wanted to um, get our timelining around internal audit and counter fraud provision synchronized. So we approved an extension, which I think Rakesh has now signed to um, have our providers extended for another year. So those will be, be the key points I would highlight. Uh, happy to take any questions. Any questions, no problem. Uh, thanks for asking, Dave Rommel. Who's going to talk to the charitable funds? Uh, so we had an um, uh, update on charitable funds, and we uh, the key things there we had were the, uh, the charity plan for 24, 25, which needs more work um, to meet the ambitions that we all had for it, in particular, to refocus the work of the charity on cardiac arrest and, and the things that Fernanda has been talking about in this meeting on uh, bystander intervention defibrillator access, CPR training and golden bands and CFRs. That has a key kind of external focus for the charity in addition to supporting the staff. Um, so we'll be uh, taking that forward. The other thing is that we've had um, a, a couple of requests or hardship application requests, which have been quite tricky to deal with. And we had recognised that we need to have better 
guidance and rules around how we can what criteria we use to consider those applications. Uh, and we are probably bringing that back to the MEPS committee as well. Is that a function of the committee? Yeah, the, um, the process is that uh, if um, uh, a member of staff makes a particular application for hardship, the first goes to Unison, um, who administer a scheme for not just for union members, but they do it widely. They consider issues up to a certain value. And if uh, a member of staff comes with something that is a greater value, um, then uh, that can be, they can, they can bring that to the charitable funds committee. Uh, but those are obviously quite difficult cases to consider. Uh, and so we just want to make sure that our seats around that are available. But I think that's a very good question. I'm not convinced that the charitable funds committee thinking about it's the right place for these things. So whilst the charity hopes all of the of the money in, I think that this is a much more BNC issue where you would want some very good HR advice that would either recommend or not before it got to the out of the funds committee, which is where we got stuck because we actually didn't know the HR implications of what we were being asked to do. Yes, it's quite tricky. It is yeah. very clearly need to yeah, look after our stuff, of course. Um, but if you look at what is the basic purpose of the charity funds, and then say we've got a process and you can have a guideline whether these things are the loans or grants, whether they are by any other criteria. But I don't think you know, about which I know very little, but it strikes me there to be some sort of problem. Yeah. Uh, and we'll be time to understand it's quite urgent. So actually, you know, the process needs to be at least um, go to as fast as possible so, so we're not adding to the stress of the. Yeah, that's a very good point for them. Like, some, like, obviously, you want to be compassionate about employers. But there's a fine amount of money where you can ensure that the process works. It has to be consistent with the bill. Sometimes speak better than that, it can be consistent with the So, however, does it we need some sort of rules? And then we certainly do. But we are going to start by looking at the same thing. We certainly do. And more than one of us in the chamber to have a very point to have to say. Anything more on the charity committee? If not, thanks very much. So, corporate, please. Yes, I was just going to pick up a couple of points out of my report, uh, starting with the fact that um, we've now published the dates for the public board meetings uh, in the coming year. And in line with our development uh, discussion, we're going to have four. We're proposing that two of them take place at our new site. That's likely to be September and March. We're just checking application arrangements to ensure the bit more to it. Um, in terms of complaints, although the number of complaints has gone up somewhat, we're keeping on top of the, uh, the backlog. It's um, uh, largely static. Um, that's despite the fact we've had some issues with uh, SIP perceptions. Um, you'll see that there's been quite a significant increase in complaints about conduct and behaviour. We're doing some more work to um, drill into that. Uh, we've had a discussion at CCOG. We're going to take a paper back there to drill into this in a bit more detail. We've also had some uh, conversations with some of the senior operation managers. It seems to me that it's very important that the people in charge of the services understand and make sure that the complaints are being made around their teams. So we're working out that we can better make sure that the senior people cited on the place in their areas. Um, the only other area I was going to mention is on policies, where you'll see that um, our policies are largely in the date. The most significant policy which needs to be updated and renewed is the new fit proper person policy, which um, is going to be more onerous of the organisation and in particular Chair and Chief Executive wanted to sign up for an annual statement attesting that we are all doing things well. Um, that is a policy that needs to be signed up for the board. Um, proposing to bring it here in May, 
it may be that the people in the middle should have seen them, but it puts forward. You want to put your hand up then? I think we need to do it before May because we're going to make the board appointments for the people. And I think it says board appointments of April have to comply with their new. Uh, I mean, I think we need to formally recognise that a board needs to be yeah. I mean, like the principles in the guide we get about the appointment. Because it, it, it's all published, which is a question of applying. So, I think the manager. Um, Robert did mention um, information governance, so I probably should just say that personnel reasonably well assured that we're on target for DSPT. Uh, and you'll see that uh, I think we're on top of um, when we do have data breaches, a pretty robust system that categorizes them and identifies the ones that need to be reported to the information commissioner. I think we've now got a pretty good relationship with the information commissioner, and usually once we brief them on our, on our case, they're, they're satisfied with the action that we've, we've taken. We start with doing some benchmarking with other organizations to understand the same compared to other organizations. I guess the very final thing I should mention is the conversation we had at lunchtime, uh, Andy, where we were talking about um, uh, a proposal to tweak the terms of reference to our board committees. At the moment, they are for just one head. I think the suggestion is that's a bit thin. Most of our committees have two or three heads on them anyway, so we should probably adjust the terms of reference to the board seat. Two nets, chair plus one. Just they had a conversation at the EDI committee that that would need to be specific about the net. Yes. Um, capability that they're making. It, it, because of the fact that we've got to cover workforce and. Yeah. There was um, an issue, um, I was serving digital, um, a shoe that was on the road, and I think um, that's quite difficult. Yeah. To, to chair and to marshal the questions. Yeah. But I don't so I happen to be there, but I'm not. I'm deliberately not a member of any yeah. of the Not allowed to. I will dip in from time to time. But um, so there was an issue there, I think, around the administration. So who then tells the the chair that some heads uh, can't make it, uh, and then over to the chair of any committee to say whether or not you want to continue. It. And it's a, 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 I mean, chorusy would relate to sort of decisions, won't it? But I think, I think the point that you were making at oh, lunchtime, it might also relate to sort of things around back, which actually aren't our decisions, aren't they? And, you know, and then the committee's making decisions. It's, it's got to be something which is which is, which is an official decision. So it's really a matter of with, from the administration side, letting people know who is there and then having a discussion with the chair to say, do you want to go, do you want to carry on to the infinity? So we you don't know, find yourself something being a real point. Yeah, it's an unusual event not to not to be bored from not to have well I mean we, we we had an independent member present, but that independent member had to leave early. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not talking about the specific, oh. I'm just saying in general we don't well, I had I, I haven't got the numbers, but there's a couple of times when someone says, oh, Andy's here, you know, um, you've got... That's OK. Yeah, no, but not... when I happen to have dropped in yeah. just to, to have a listen. So yeah. anyway, it's just about, it's, it's not a big thing, it's about the time you get up. So that mm -hmm. I the top, you did, you did a great job in a difficult situation. I would find it difficult sharing these and asking the question. And the point thing, if you make a decision, is that a valid decision? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not for the chair that will get you to go chasing other bits of their loose. Or incentives for them to do. Three more tenants. Good. New role. Right. Any questions? So, a question about the increase in voices. Yes. Strongly think that it's quite distinct. Which ones? The increase so in, in quests. If you look at the graph of an inquest, you'll see there's been a significant step change in 2023. Um, I think the initial theory was it was the backlog of COVID, but I don't think that's true. I think you'll see the changes sustained. That's one of the reasons why we commissioned the external review of legal services. There was a there was a proposal that we looked at staffing in legal, and one of the uh, one of the things in the the cost pressures 
uh, is one additional post to the same world of scope of the work of the current space. But for now, it's probably not more than for the other economical reason behind that. Uh, so I think primarily for many patients with us point of contact. So we hold the information around what, what was the information coming in about the patient at the time. Um, was there anything that the coroner may want to explore about the circumstances? And we can assist. Um, the, the challenge is um, that they, the number of patients that we attend um, means that we will, we will be assisting coroners. I just don't know why it's increased. Well, I think it comes back to Karen's point we had earlier this morning that the UBC pathway is not yeah. working very well. That would be so nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
two percent it doesn't look very big we um, have exactly the same question it's like uh exactly it, it exactly is quite it's hmm? not in the same it's like a few other countries yeah it is actually quite a, a challenging uh target but but i think that uh, Gordon Wong will point out this whole tape this whole paper needs to be rewritten in plain english yeah. Because there is no way we can take this into the proper operating that or next year is my best. Yeah. It, it is not comprehensive. So, um, and then we could actually explain what we actually meant by reducing our service by 2% so that it wasn't. But yeah. nearly every line requires a rethink about yeah. you know, how we've described it. <laughs> so, what should I do? Well, I think we can prove it. That's fine. Right. But, um, but like, when we come to actually produce our operating plan for the year, yeah, yeah. which this thing getting incorporated, yeah. this needs to turn into a data. Yeah. Which, I'm also asking for something plus the point of process because it essentially comes to the policy in Calgary. Yeah, so, but then it sits alongside inside the rest of the product we're doing in. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this time we've totally aligned what's in here mm -hmm. what we're going to put in our operating plan. Yeah, so they are, there is no difference. Good. Is it, and I have seen the other places almost two separate lots. What is it? What's wrong? I mean, no, it's just since it's right. Okay, so I will do myself on that one. So we we approve this plan subject to, but then we look for it to be incorporated and uh, the river going to fit in. So we're not looking into separate lots. We're not. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. I mean, they have to be reported separately, but yeah, they, I get that. That's the process. process. Yeah. yeah. What peculiarity. Right. Yeah, Ollie, can you can you just take us just the, the sort of McKinsey four percent reduction in job site essentially? Where, where, where does that play through into these? It's just you do four percent in a year. I'm just saying that. Where... The four percent is actually an increase in uh, available time or ambulances. Okay. Which is achieved by reducing so our service, sure. reducing JCT, and having more people. So we've got reduced the two percent for out of service. Yes, which is a which contributes to how do you have a four percent increase in availability of ambulance? I suppose your point is where is the rest of the JCT? Yes, exactly. Where are the other hands? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it on there. So remember, so this is a subset of this quality priorities thing of things that you're, you're trying to get a narrow list of things that you're agreeing to do, as opposed to the whole everything in the operating plan, mm -hmm. where I suspect we will end up with something in the operating plan about JCT. Well, I was just building on our conversation last time, which was we're spending potentially too long with patients where actually the right thing to do from a quality perspective is just to convey them. And that in doing that, we would reduce the job site. So. But that's the one that is producing delays, where it says undertaking why projects reduce all ways to see what the C2 level is. What's that? So we did that. So it's not specifically <laughs> called out around the impact of the on scene time. For those patients that we're going to convey, if you look at the job completion time and the increase of so the job size for the patients, even nice. That's what it's not too big to get. That was the big takeaway. Yeah. No. No. One. Take right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Increase our productivity by. It's clear that the patient is going to be more efficient with the decisions to convey. It's it's a we win, you know, it's better patient experience and outcomes as they get there quicker, better for our productivity. I'm just thinking, it's worth thinking about this. Oh, I thought I'd stop it. Oh, the reducing delays, C2 less than 37 and the long term, but it's not explicitly drawn out in, in that term of so for many things. So we look forward to this being incorporated into the operating plan. Um, and capture the points that they make, yeah. And, and we're possibly linked to the financial requirements and pressures we have um, for like 25. Yes. So I think we need to just make that link. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
explicit and that's all through. Well, with, when the team do this, they're absolutely clear that none of these things are cause pressures that we have given ourselves. So they're all things that we need to do to deliver the financial existing. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there's also a big data in this that you agree a whole heap on mm. things that massively improve quality good but cost you lots of money that yeah. we don't have that's not this this right so we agree the paper so I suppose well, yeah. good well, uh, thank you Mark over to you yeah this is the quarter four importance of that so rather than comment on specifics it's been a more comment thematically um I suppose if I was trying to um uh, describe our uh, back to the auditors. I would say we were able to demonstrate a number of things. First of all, the link to our business plans. Secondly, that for the majority of the risks, we can demonstrate progress through the year. Those risks, particularly in recent months, have been some quite significant reductions in risk scores. Um, thirdly, um, we can demonstrate that as new risks emerge in the year, we add them. And uh, I guess finally, we could demonstrate that as risks are resolved, we, we take the confidence we've got the long term. I always think it's interesting to reflect on the risks where the score hasn't changed over the course of the year. Whether that's because we're dealing with some kind of entrenched problem, um, or there's some other reason why we're not able to make uh, progress in reducing scores. And um, because this is the core of four position, we'll now be refreshing this for you see in May to take account of the, the new business plan. So I'm sure many of the risks will be the same, but we'll be judging it against the new business plan and seeing if there's new things that need to be put in there. Okay. Any questions on Mark? If not, thanks for watching. Thank you. So we then move on to any other business. Is there any other business? Trouble, please. Uh, uh, no, sorry, my hand was up for the previous item, Andy. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I think to, to note um, in the context of other boards I sit on, I think the BAF and the way it works at LAS is actually very good. So I just wanted to thank Mark and the rest of the exec for the good work that, that they, they do there. Thank you. That is part of our congratulations. Thanks to everyone involved in that. Any other business? Well, around with them. Down with them. Right. Any, um, do you think I did? Well, I don't know. You, you sort of, I thought you were about to say something then. I was about to say, well done for chairing the meeting. Well, that's an excellent point. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for the arrangements for today. Well done. Thank you very much for doing it. So, is that it? We are have no questions from the public. No questions. Uh, good. Right. We'll meet you then. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, deeply enjoyable. We're still being recorded. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So we better get off. <laughs> Have a good day. I'll see you, Robert. Bye. Take care. Bye.